coordinator, just, I don't know if you guys have heard that before, a van coordinator is usually a nurse or an MP or something like that at the implanting center, so in this case St. Vincent, they completely take care of these patients. That's their only job, that's what they do. They take care of them in-house, they take care of them once they're out in the community. If I couldn't be here, um, a van coordinator would be here giving this class or making sure that he was safe to be in the community. Does that make sense? But anybody that's with me, I have to carry a card around in my wallet that has my uh, coordinator's information. This is the card. And anybody that's uh, around me that takes care of me has to be LBAD trained, and they also have to carry a card so that it shows that they have the training and they have, they have to remain with me at all times, like even at, during transport or anything else. That's not the norm. I'm here to tell you. That's not a bad thing. That's um, what my coordinator is. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. But I'm, I'm speaking from patients that could possibly be in your community in the future. Um, that's not the norm. They might not always have a caregiver. They might not always have all of their ducks in a row. These people are really organized. It might not always be a perfect case scenario, just so you know, which is why I'm here. Um, but for the most part, they're at least supposed to have this black bag and uh, bad coordinator phone numbers, and those those people are on call 24-7. So there's always somebody on call that will call you right back. And I know the girls at St. Vincent that are all very good. So um, it is a good idea to let a caregiver uh, ride with, if that is something that you guys can do, because they know more about this than I do. They're taking care of themselves at home, they have caregivers that help take care of them at home, and they can help you do whatever it is needs to be done. Does that make sense? So you use them and play around. Right now, I'm pretty comfortable that he's going to have a caregiver with him 24-7, but in the future, it may not always be that way. Questions? Um, okay, so just a few odds and ends about how this all works. This is a continuous flow pump. If your heart was a piece of machinery, if it were a pump with metal, it would be a pulsatile pump. It fills, it ejects. Fill, eject. This is not that. It doesn't fill and eject. There's just one moving part in here called a rotor. Again, remember that thing that's like a propeller? This is a continuous loop. So his heart still goes through systole and diastole, okay? If you put the leads on, he'll come up on the monitor and he should be in normal sinus, okay? His heart only goes through a phase of systole and diastole. Does it completely fill and completely eject? It's just continuously looping around. But he still has the same pathways in his heart that make him go through systole and diastole. Now he has a pacemaker AICD, that's the norm. Most of them will have a pacemaker AICD. Um, any AICD has a pacemaker with it. It's always a, a one-two combo. It's not one or the other. Does that make sense? So if you think of it, your heart is like a house. Um, your house has electricity, it has plumbing. This guy takes care of the plumbing. He has a pacemaker AICD that takes care of the electricity. So can he have arrhythmias and things like that? Yes, he can, and you would treat them as such, but that, that's what that AICD is in there for. So I'm gonna talk about emergencies and what to do and how to, what, how to treat them, but you have to remember, he has a pacemaker. So I come here to give you scenarios that aren't really gonna happen. So. Do you have a blood pressure that you feel the go? We'll, we'll get there. We'll talk about blood pressure, I promise. Um, one more, uh, just aside. So obviously, Todd looks pretty healthy, right? These patients don't get this pump they, um, and kind of sit in the hospital. That's not the goal. Our goal is for them to have a good life, at least until they get their heart or for as long as possible. He wouldn't be out in the community if he wasn't stable enough to be out in the community especially being an hour and a half from St. Vincent or whatever, an hour and a half, yeah. Um, my point is, is he's cardiac and bad stable. I can't say it's not going to happen, but you're probably not going to get called because he has a bad or a cardiac problem. We train EMS like you guys in case they have another problem, in case they need to come here because they break their head or because they have appendicitis or in their car accident or they're dehydrated so he doesn't feel good, things like that. Very rarely are you guys getting called because of a heart, actual cardiac problem. Does that make sense? Um, 
know in Chicago, most of my centers teach their patients that if they have any type of a fall or any amount of trauma to this site, they're supposed to call EMS and have them transport to their implanting center. Reason being is that there's hardware in their chest. And if they take a fall, perhaps one of those sutures could break or something like that. They just want to be proactive with that issue. Also, they want to start antibiotics as early as possible with any amount of trauma. Because if you break that new skin that's building into this percutaneous lead, it almost always gets infected. Were you taught that? It's kind of regional. Yeah, we were just taught care. How about if you fall, are you supposed to call EMS or something? We didn't know that. It's regional. That's just a Chicago. That's kind of what they do there. My point is, is that you guys aren't going to get called because the bat is all off. The bat, it doesn't shut off unless you have the batteries die or something like that. You're going to be dealing with other things. I can tell you that dehydration is a big one, okay? These patients, and I'm not sure what your pre-op course was, but most of these patients deteriorate, deteriorate over a 15 or 20 year span. And as they get sicker and sicker with heart failure, they go on a fluid restriction. Okay? and a salt-restricted diet. So they're used to restricting themselves to like a liter of fluid a day to not overload their lungs and their heart because their heart can't do its job anymore. Okay? With this pump, it's not like that anymore. Okay? They have to drink. If they get dry, if they don't have enough preload, they don't have enough fluid in their left ventricle, this pump starts sucking air and the walls of the ventricles start sucking down on each other. Does that make sense? So dehydration is a big deal with these patients and it's a really really common reason for you guys to get called because they don't feel good. I don't feel good. I think I should probably go to the hospital, okay? A lot of times that's fixed with fluid. You'll see that with these patients, a lot of your problems that you'll find out in the field are going to be fixed with fluid, okay? If it's not fixable with fluid, give them fluid anyways because you're not going to hurt it. This pump is going to continually unload the left side of the heart, which is all that matters. You're not going to overload. So start your IV, start your fluids, see what happens. Um, fluid overloading a heartbeat too or any LVAD patient is hard to do and easy to fix. So keep that in mind um, with your fluid initiation. Yes? Uh, an underlying problem with me that I would have run into is I'm very potassium dependent. And if my potassium level goes down, then that starts uh, my atrium. He's got a low potassium. It's going to make his heart have arrhythmias, fibrillate, maybe, uh, uh, maybe a little VTAC, just something weird going on. Okay, so he doesn't feel good. Maybe his pacemaker is fire, or his AICD is firing. That would be another reason that he would be called. Okay, and that would be another thing that would probably be fixed or not not hurt with fluid. Okay, so keep that in mind. At the hospital, and he kept going what they call dry. Dry. And when the when there's not enough fluid in the body, like what she was saying, they call them dry, and then they have the they start going into the different fibrillations and things when they're dry. And she the way she explained it to me was like a swimming pool pump. When the water starts getting low on the on the swimming pool pump, then it starts sucking all the air, and so that's what she was saying when she said that it, it just starts sucking air it, and so they you need to give them fluid and then she said especially if if they get the flu or they get sick make sure you give them a lot of fluids so this is kind of what's going on here so remember this is inflow so this is in the apex of the left ventricle okay so this is the left ventricle right now it's full and it's happy okay um, that rotor spinning it's continually unloading it's got enough fluid to unload okay so things are good when he gets dehydrated, these walls, that rotor that's spinning, it doesn't slow down because there's not enough fluid and not enough preload or anything. It doesn't care. It keeps going, okay? And then the walls of the left ventricle suck down on each other. They can occlude the info cannula. When they suck down on each other, they irritate each other. And that's what gives him VTAC, VFib, things like that. Does that make sense? Yeah? Um, 